Hi, how's everybody doing? All right, let me give everybody a second as the live is going for people to come in. Um, if you're getting this notification on your phone, you're at home, we know you're there. We're just one in here with the Boys and Girls Club. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Mr. Kurt, as the kids affectionately called me. Um, and I miss you guys, all my little babies. Everybody over at Rebound, I'm the unit director for the Rebound Alternative site. And I'm just here today to do an online book club. We want to engage with you. And so let me introduce the book that we'll be doing today. It is a book that has been a favorite book of mine that I've read since I was a kid. This is from Gary Paulson, and the book is called Hatchet. Um, a wonderful book, a wonderful story that we're going to dive into today. And so as people are joining in, as you're tuning in, as you're getting the broadcast, please do me a favor. Go ahead, and hit that share button. We want you parents, if you're at home with your kids, we want you to gather your kids around. We're going to be doing this online um, book club. We're going to be reading it aloud. We're letting you know that you could also come to the club. We have a limited few copies of these books if you want to read along with us, that you could come if you're picking up your meals. Just a reminder, we're actually starting our lunchtime um, from 12 to 1.30. We'll be giving out lunches uh, for our members and community members alike. Come grab a lunch today. We'll also be giving out suppers in the afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30, so please come along for that as well. And if you request a copy of this book, we'll go ahead and get you a copy of this book. If you have a tablet, an e-reader, if you already have services such as Kindle or Audible, you can go ahead and look for those services there. But if you have any questions, just stop by the club and we'll help walk you through it if you want to get uh, some copies um, online or uh, try to get a physical copy here. And so we're so excited to be doing this today. We're going to be going through chapter one. Then this afternoon at two o'clock, we'll be going through chapter two. And then we'll also be doing a review of chapter one and chapter two this afternoon. So those review questions will be posted. So parents, if you want something for your kids to do, have them read along. And then after this broadcast, they can do the review questions um, for chapter one and chapter two. And we'll have a great time there. So I think we've given you guys a few moments for people to come in. Please feel free to share. Um, please feel free to let people know. Um, after the broadcast is done, you can still share it and have people watch it or rewatch it. Say if you don't tune in right away, if you're scrambling around to get the kids together, um, you can still review the broadcast and have this available for you. But I'm excited to start chapter one of the book Hatchet by Gary Paulson. Brian Roberson stared out the window of the small plane at the endless green northern wilderness below. It was a small plane a Cessna 406, a bush plane. And the engine was so loud, so roaring and consuming and loud that it ruined any chance for conversation. Not that he had much to say. He was 13 and the only passenger on the plane with a pilot named, what was it, Jim or Jake or something, who was in his mid forties and who had been silent as he worked to prepare for takeoff. In feet since Bryans had come to the small airport in Hampton, New York, to meet the plane driven by his mother, the pilot had only spoken five words to him, get in the co-pilot seat, which Brian had done. They had taken off, and that was the last of the conversation. There had been initial excitement, of course. He had never flown in a single-engine plane before, and to be sitting in the co-pilot seats with all the controls right there in front of him, all the instruments in his face as the plane clawed for altitude, jerking and sliding on the wind currents as the pilot took off had been interesting and very exciting. But in five minutes, they had leveled off at 6,000 feet and headed northwest, and from then on, the pilot had been silent. Staring out the front and the drone of the engine had been all that was left. The drone of the sea green trees that lay before the plane's nose and flowed to the horizon spread with lakes, swamps, and wandering streams and rivers. Now Brian sat, looking out the window, with the roar thundering through his ears and tried to catalog what had led up to taking this flight. The thinking started. Always it started with a single word, divorce. It was an ugly word, he thought. A tearing, ugly word that meant fights and yellings, lawyers. God, he thought, how he hated lawyers who sat with their comfortable smiles and tried to explain to him in legal terms how all that he had lived in was coming apart and the breaking and shattering of all the solid things, his home, his life, all the solid things, divorce. A breaking word, an ugly breaking word. Divorce, secrets, no, not secrets so much as just the secret. What he knew and had not told anybody. What he knew about his mother that had caused the divorce. And what he knew, the secret. Brian felt his eyes beginning to burn. And he knew that there would be tears. He had cried for a time, but that was gone now. He didn't cry now. Instead, his eyes burned and tears came the seeping tears that burned. 
He wiped his eyes with a finger and looked at the pilot out the corner of his eye to make sure he hadn't noticed the burning tears. The pilot sat, large, his hands lightly on the wheel, feet on the rudder pedals. He seemed more a machine than a man, an extension of the plane. On the dashboard in front of him, Brian saw dials, switches, meters, knobs, levers, cranks, lights, handles that were all wiggling and flickering. All indicated nothing that he understood, and the pilot seemed the same way, part of the plane, not human. When he saw Brian look at him, the pilot seemed to open up a bit, and he smiled. Ever fly in the co-pilot seat before? He leaned over and lifted the headset off his right ear and put it to his temple, yelling to overcome the sound of the engine. Brian shook his head. He had never been in any kind of plane, never seen the cockpit of a plane, except in films or on television. It was loud and confusing. First time. It's not as complicated as it looks. Good planes like this almost flies itself, the pilot shrugged. Makes my job easy. He took Brian's arm. Here, put your hands on the control, your feet on the rudder pedals, and I'll show you what I mean. Brian shook his head. I better not. Sure, try it, the pilot said. Brian reached out and took the wheel in a grip so tight his knuckles were white. He pushed his feet down on the pedals. The plane slewed suddenly to the right. Not so hard. Take her light. Brian eased off and relaxed his grip. The burning in his eyes had forgotten, for, was forgotten momentarily as the vibration of the plane came through the wheel and the pedals. It seemed almost alive. See, the pilot let go of his wheel, raised his hands in the air, and took his feet off the pedals to show Brian he was actually flying the plane alone. Simple. Now turn the wheel a little bit to the right and push on the right rotor pedal a small amount. Brian turned the wheel slightly and the plane immediately banked to the right. And when he pressed on the right rudder pedal, the nose slid across the horizon to the right. He left off on the pressure and straightened the wheel and the plane righted itself. Now you can turn. Bring her back to the left a little. Brian turned the wheel left and pushed on the left pedal and the plane came back around. It's easy, he smiled. Well, at least this part. The pilot nodded. All of flying is easy, just takes learning, like everything else. He took the controls back, then reached up and rubbed his left shoulders. Aches and pains, must be getting old. Brian let go of the controls and moved his feet away from the pedals as the pilot put his hands on the wheels, said thank you. But the pilot had put his headset back on and the gratitude was lost in the engine noise and things went back to Brian looking out the window at an ocean of trees and lakes. The burning eyes did not come back, but memories did. They came flooding in. And the words, always the words, divorce, the secret, fights, split. The big split. Brian's father did not understand as Brian did, um, that, that knew that Brian's mother wanted to break the marriage apart. The split had come and then the divorce, all so fast, and the court had left him with his mother except for the summers and what the judge called visitation rights. So formal. Brian hated judges as he hated lawyers. Judges that leaned over the bench and asked Brian if he understood where he was to live and why. Judges who did not know what really happened. Judges with a caring look that meant nothing as lawyers said legal phrases that meant nothing. In the summer, Brian would live with his father and in the school year with his mother. That's what the judge said looking at the papers on his desk and listening to the lawyers talk all those words. Now the plane lurched slightly to the right and Brian looked at the pilot. He was rubbing his shoulder again and there was a sudden smell of body gas in the plane. Brian turned back to avoid embarrassing the pilot who was obviously in some discomfort. Must have stomach troubles. So this summer, this first summer when he was allowed to have visitation rights with his father, with a divorce only one month old, Brian was heading north. His father was a mechanical engineer who had designed or invented a new drill bit for oil drilling, a self-cleaning, self-sharpening bit. He was working in the oil fields of Canada up on the tree line where the tundra started and the forest ended. Brian was riding up from New York with some drilling equipment. It was latched down in the rear of the plane next to a fabric bag the pilot had called a survival pack, which had emergency supplies in case they had to make an emergency landing that had to be specially made in the city. Riding in the bush plane with a pilot named Jim or Jake or something who had turned out to be an all right guy letting him fly and all. Except for the smell, now there was a constant odor and Brian took another look at the pilot and find his rubbing his shoulder down to the arm and down the left arm, letting go more gas and wincing Probably something he ate, Brian thought. 
His mother had driven him from the city to meet the plane at Hampton, where it came to pick up the drilling equipment. A drive in silence, a long drive in silence. Two and a half hours of sitting in the car, staring out the window, just as he was now staring out the window of the plane. Once after an hour, when they were out the city, she turned to him. Look, can't we talk this over? Can't we talk this out? Can't you tell me what's bothering you? And there were the words again, divorce, split, the secret. How could he tell her what he knew? So he remained silent, shook his head, and continued to stare unseen at the countryside. And his mother had gone back to driving, only to speak to him one more time when they were close to the Hamptons. She reached over the back of the seat and brought up a paper sack. I got something for you, for the trip. Brian took the sack and opened the top. Inside, there was a hatchet, the kind with a steel handle and a rubber hand grip. The head was in a stout leather case and that had a brass riveted belt loop. It goes on your belt, his mother smoked now without looking to him. There were some farm trucks on the road now and she had to weave through them and watch traffic. The man at the store said you could use it, you know, in the woods with your father. Dad, he thought, not my father, my dad. Thanks, it's really nice, but the words sounded hollow, even to Brian. Try it on, see how it looks on your belt. And he would normally have said no, would normally have said no that it looked too hokey to have a hatchet on your belt. Those were the normal things he would say. But her voice was thin and had a sound, something thin that would break if you touched it. And he felt bad for not speaking to her, knowing what he knew, even with the anger, the hot white hate of his anger at her, he still felt bad for not speaking to her. And so to humor her, he loosened his belt and pulled the right side out and put the hatchet on and rethreaded the bed. Scooch around so I can see, she said. He moved around in the seat, feeling only slightly ridiculous. She nodded, just like a scout, my little scout. And there were the tenderness in the voice that she had when he was small, the tenderness that she had when he was small and sick with a cold. And she put her hand on his forehead and the burning came to his thighs again. And he turned away from her and looked out the window, forgotten that the hatchet was on his belt. So he arrived at the plane with the hatchet still on his belt. Because it was a bush flight from a small airport, there had been no security and the plane had been waiting. With the engine running when he arrived and he grabbed his suitcase and pack bag and ran for the plane without stopping to remove the hatchet. So it was still on his belt. At first he had been embarrassed, but the pilot had said nothing about it, and Brian forgot it as they took off and began flying. More smell now. Bad. Brian turned again to glance at the pilot, who had both hands on his stomach and was grimacing in pain. He reached for the left shoulder again as Brian watched. Don't know, kid. The pilot's words were a hiss, barely audible. Bad aches here. Bad aches. Thought it was something I ate, but... He stopped as a fresh spasm of pain hit him. Even Brian could see how bad it was. The pain drove the pilot back into the seat, back and down. I've never had anything like this. The pilot reached for the switch on his mic cord, his hand coming up in a small arc from his stomach, and he flipped the switch and said, this is flight four, six. And now a jolt took him like a hammer blow, so forcefully that he seemed to crush back into his seat. Brian reached for him, could not understand at first what it was, could not know, and then, he knew. Brian knew. The pilot's mouth went rigid. He swore and jerked a short series of slams into the seat, holding his shoulder now, swore and hissed. Chest! Oh my God, my chest is coming apart. Brian knew now. The pilot was having a heart attack. Brian had been in the shopping mall with his mother when a man in front of the Paisley store had suffered a heart attack. He had gone down and screamed about his chest, an old man, much older than the pilot. Brian knew. The pilot was having a heart attack and even as the knowledge came to Brian, he saw the pilot slam into the seat one more time. One more awful time, he slammed back into the seat and his right leg jerked, pulling the plane to the side in a sudden twist and his hell fell forward and spit came. Spit came from the corners of his mouth and his legs contracted up into the seat and his eyes rolled back into his head until there was only white. Only white for his eyes and the smell became worse. Filled the cockpit and all of it so fast, so incredibly fast, that Brian's mind could not take it at first, could only see it in stages. The pilot had been talking just a moment ago, complaining of the pain. He had been talking. Then the jolts came. The jolts that took the pilot had come back. And now Brian sat there and there was a strange feeling of silence in the thorming roar of an engine, 
A strange feeling of silence and being alone. Brian was stopped. He was stopped. Inside, he was stopped. He could not think past what he saw, what he felt. All was stopped. The very core of him, the very center of Brian Roberson was stopped and stricken with a white flash of horror, a terror so intense that his breathing, his thinking, and nearly his heart had stopped. Seconds passed, seconds that became all of his life. He began to know what he was seeing, began to understand what he saw, and that was worse, so much worse that he wanted to make his mind freeze again. He was sitting in a bush plane, roaring 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness with a pilot who had just suffered a massive heart attack and he was either dead or in something close to a coma. He was alone in the roaring plane with no pilot. He was alone. And that concludes chapter one of The Hatchet. Woo, I'm excited to see what happens in chapter two. Brian is there by himself. He's in a plane 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness. What's going to happen? Well, if you want to find out, you can join us later on today at 2 p.m. Well, we're all over the world right now. Central Standard Time. Just in case if you shared this with someone across, please do that. Share it with friends and family every, all across the country, all across the nation. Um, that we will be back here at 2 o'clock. And we're going to be posting some review questions for chapter one and chapter two as well. So we'll please tune back in at two o'clock. We're currently still serving lunches here um, at 250 North Springer Street. If you're in the area and you want to come grab a lunch for you and your family, like I said, we'll be serving supper as well from 3.30 to 5.30. Um, and also we have a few limited copies of the books hatchet here. Um, if you want to come grab a copy for you and your family to read along or for your kids, please feel free to do so. But join us every day at 12 12 and 2 p.m. as we're going to be going through this exciting book. I know there's a lot more twists and turns to come, so please engage with us, join with us, and don't forget to share this to all your friends and family, and we're so excited to have you guys here. We'll see you at 2 p.m. for Chapter 2.